I'm going to be starting a new series where I'll be diving into different projects that are common tasks for marketers, analysts, and data scientists. These tasks often require multiple stages and use a variety of programming languages, tools, and frameworks. For this project, we'll be querying landing page data from GA4 in BigQuery. Then we'll be using Python to pull status codes, and then finally circling back to BigQuery to add more data to our data set. And we'll be marrying that up with our status code data. And then in our final step away from the data gathering, we'll be building a Tableau dashboard with the ability to filter by status code, as well as some of the other dimensions that we include in the next phase. As a caveat, I usually use Search Console data for this analysis, but Google doesn't have samples of Search Console data in BigQuery. So it's really helpful to see when a page broke and overall trends with these pages, but we just don't have that ability. So to kick things off today, I'm going to explain how we identify landing pages in GA4 using SQL. I'll break it down step by step so that it's easy or at least easier to understand. But first, I want to go over some basic vocab because I recognize that some of the people watching this video may be brand new to SQL. So at least with BigQuery, there are a few terms you need to be familiar with. First of all, up at the top here, you'll see the project name. Then a little bit lower down over here, you'll see the project ID, which is directly related to the project name. It just doesn't have spaces. Under the project ID, you'll see a number of data sets and each data set is simply put a collection of tables. It could also be views, but we'll get to that in a minute. But think of a data set as like an Excel workbook or a Google Sheets workbook. And in a workbook, you may have many tables, or you might just have a couple, or you may just have one. BigQuery is organized the same way. And then finally, we have your table. I think the icon for a table actually looks more like a calculator, but here we have it. So tables can be just garden variety tables like you'd see again in Excel or Google Sheets. And you see an example of that here. But some tables like the tables in Google Analytics are partitioned. And we see that in the data set here that will be parked in the rest of this video. It has an icon like this, which really just looks like a table layered on top of another table. This just means that you have a table for each partition. The most common partition I've seen out in the wild is date, and that's how GA data is partitioned. Um, simply put, it just means that you have a table for each day, but that's customizable, so you can partition your data by whatever makes the most sense to you. But typically it's going to be by date. Also, usually you can search for a table and even favorite it in BigQuery. But for some reason, BigQuery won't let me do that with the GA4 data. I don't know why I can with GA3. So go fig. Okay, next up we have a view. So you can create a view, which is a very lightweight way to store data that you don't use regularly. And technically, you're not actually storing the data. The data is just created on the fly when you call it. So you save on storage costs. But if it's a large data set and or you use it in a dashboard that's regularly updated or accessed, it could bring your dashboards that swim downstream of these views to their knees. I've learned this the hard way. So I mostly just use them for ad hoc analyses and use tables for dashboards, but your mileage may vary. Anyway, they look like cute little kitty cats. You say the kitty cat? Oh, there is one out there? Okay, let's jump into GA4. So we're going to spend the rest of our time together in this GA4 obfuscated sample e-commerce data set. 
specifically in the events table. It's the only table in the data set, so that's pretty straightforward. When I'm working with a new data set or table, I like to start by viewing the schema for a table. You open that by just clicking on the table. When you do that, you'll see multiple columns, the field name, the type, and that's just the data type, and then the mode. And I'll be deconstructing what each of these means. So this basically just gives us a list of all the dimensions and metrics we have to work with. So let's talk first about this type column. And one thing that you'll find is that you don't have dimensions and metrics kind of separated out like you do with some data sources. They could be combined. Let's first talk about this type column. So this is just referring to data types. As a general rule, the most common data types you'll see when dealing with GA data are record, string, integer, float or double, and Boolean. Notice I didn't say date or date time. That's very unique to Google Analytics. Then that's because Google stores dates as strings. As far as I can recall, it's the only data source I've ever worked with that does that. So a common task I had when I worked with a lot of GA data was to convert these strings to a date format. We're not going to be dealing with dates today though, as I'm focused on the task at hand, which is pulling the status code data and marrying it up with any data source. So for that, we just need landing pages. But the data that comes from these other data sources that you might want to marry it up with could be from your CMS, BuzzSumo data, one of my absolute favorite marketing tools, especially that leans more content oriented, Search Console, other SEO tools, you name it. But today we're focused on Google Analytics. So let's go through each of these to understand what they are and how they're used. So going through the first column, because this is kind of the chewiest. First, we have records. So a record is simply a data type that groups multiple fields, each potentially of a different data type, into a single, I guess you could call it an entity. This is useful for representing nested and sometimes hierarchical data. If you see a chevron or that like right facing arrow, it's a visual indicator of a record like you see all through this table. You can click them to peek inside like I will here and here. You also have nested records like outlines where one category might just contain a list where another might contain subcategories with lists under them. This will make more sense as we kind of go through an example. Next up, we have string. The string data type is a sequence of characters often used to store text. The traffic source record has fields with strings, for example, medium, source, and name. A name is just the campaign name. Next up, we have integer. Basically, an integer is a whole number without a fractional component. So for example, any timestamp like you see with event timestamp and IDs like vendor ID and advertising ID, which are both under device here. Also, any time you calculate a count of a dimension like uh, you count of user ID or count of country, something like that, you'll use integers. Then a float or a double is a number that can have a fractional component. So there's actually a slight difference between a float and a double. A double just gets you much more precise data. And I noticed that GA4 uses doubles, at least in the data that I pulled, even when a float would be more than sufficient. Okay, and then finally, we have a Boolean data type, but it doesn't actually show up as Boolean in Google Analytics, but this is a very common data type elsewhere. So a Boolean just represents a binary value of true or false. So we won't work with any examples of Boolean values today, 
because this uh, GA4, I don't know if GA4, at least the, the standard GA4 doesn't use it. Maybe in the custom dimensions, you can use it. I'm not sure, but I will actually oftentimes create Boolean fields or columns on the fly and then use them as filters in my dashboard. So for example, I might have logic that identifies if a visitor came from a particular metro area using the metro dimension, which in my opinion is one of the unsung heroes as far as dimensions go way better than the city dimension. But I might call it NYC visitor and then use that as a segment or even a filter in my dashboard. Okay, so I promise we'll start writing our query soon, but there's another detail we need to talk about first. So I don't scare you off when we start writing the query. And that is the difference between GA4 and GA3, also known as Universal Analytics, and how it impacts our query writing. Lots and lots of bloggers have talked about the differences between GA3 and GA4. I'm going to be specifically focusing on how it affects writing queries. So with GA4, the approach to data collection and analysis, as many of you know, is quite different. And as a result, requires much more complicated queries. So why is that? Well, for starters, in GA3, the data model was session-based, meaning interactions are grouped into sessions. But GA4, on the other hand, uses an event-driven model where every interaction is captured as an event. One of the main objectives of this shift to an event-based model was to synchronize the reporting frameworks for websites and apps. The positive of this change is it allows for unified reporting and analysis between websites and apps. Personally, I'm glad I rarely work with web analytics these days as I almost exclusively work on AI projects. However, after working with machine learning models and AI as much as I have these past couple of years, I must say that I have a greater appreciation for how GA4 is really taking a more knowledge graph-like approach to data collection and analysis. This approach aligns with the kind of the broader trend of moving away from structured, predefined data models to more flexible, interconnected, and contextual data representations. So what does that mean? This diagram by Manifera explains it pretty nicely. There are a lot of variations on this theme, but I thought that this one was pretty good. So in GA3, like we have over here, you have the user at the top of the hierarchy and those users engage in sessions. And within a session, there were different types of hits and events with a wide variety of labels. With GA4, you have users and events. So users are assigned a variety of properties and you see that over here, but you have many more properties than just location and age. Some other ones you could use uh, maybe gender, although that might be a little dangerous, but language, device category, so that just is like mobile, desktop, or tablet, browser, operating system, uh, if it's an app, the app version, interest that pulls in like third-party data, even things like membership status. So if the person is a subscriber or a member or however you define the different levels of membership that can also captured as a property. So then we have these events. Now the events is where things start to get tricky, but I went to pretty extensive efforts to break this down as simply and hopefully as clearly as possible. So events have associated parameter names and values. So users, they just have properties, but events have these parameter names 
and then for each parameter name, you have a value. In many programming languages like Python, these are called key value pairs. So examples of these might include, and I created this little table here to help us through this. So you might have a page view event. I just marked uh, in this column if it was standard, like out of the box, or if it was custom. So I'm not going to specify standard or custom each time. So you have these page view events and one of the parameter names or keys as they're sometimes called is this page location. Now this takes some getting used to if you worked with Google Analytics 3 where it, this was called, what was it, a page path. But apps don't really have paths, at least not always. Um, and so they just kind of standardized it and called it page location. So the value for a particular page view might be the home page. Then you could have a purchase event and you might have a parameter called transaction ID. And then the value for that key uh, might be one, two, three, four, five, six you could have a button click and have a parameter name of button name and then the value that will be specific to your website or your app so you might call that button email sign up but then you could have another parameter name for button text and that will specify the text that actually shows up on the button which might say sign up here on and on. You can go through these on your own time. But notice that Boolean value in there. I can't help myself. I'm always throwing in Boolean value. Not always, but pretty frequently. Okay, so why don't users have these key value pairs like events? Well, it's because user data doesn't change as frequently. So properties do the trick. Events, on the other hand, can change multiple times in a single session. Like if you click on three different buttons or you add multiple items to your shopping cart. So you just need like a little extra brawn because you need to be able to identify both the key and the value for it, that key. These days, I have to say, I rarely ever export data from a tool's UI. I'm mostly working with APIs, ETL tools or ELT tools like Supermetrics and Stitch and databases. And then sometimes I'm importing that data into a Python script if I want to do analysis that requires Python logic or I, let's say I want to run it through a machine learning model or automate a process. And we're going to get into a lot of these types of projects. But other times I do all my data modeling and cleanup right in the database. Like if I'm just creating new columns or doing simple cleanup, I might just do that right in BigQuery or, or Snowflake and then import it into Tableau. Tableau is my favorite dashboarding tool, uh, unless I'm building out like really interactive dashboards, then I like using Plotly, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, Python package. And I'll also use Plotly to build out really amped up interactive presentations. These presentations are cool because you know, I could click on a particular visualization and it might flower like right in front of the client, you know, so we could like drill down to a particular segment and uh, dig into that segment. I have examples of all of this in my portfolio. I'll try to remember to link to my portfolio in the video description, but, and this is a big but. With GA4, the price you pay for all this progress is that any session-based reporting, like the landing page analysis we'll be doing, necessitates either the use of subqueries and or CTEs. So CTE is just short for a common table expression, but the cool kids really just call them CTEs. I personally rarely use subqueries because I think they're messier and harder to interpret. A friend of mine 
Tim Stewart sold me on CTEs like five years ago and I've never looked back. Plus CTEs lend themselves beautifully to frameworks like DBT, which just stands for data build tool. I hope to do a series on that. It's a really amazing tool. That said, I had to use subqueries for this beast of a query in addition to CTEs because when I originally just tried to use CTEs, the query was much longer. And then when I asked ChatGPT to optimize my query, it was like, okay, you have some repetition here and it combined subqueries with CTEs. Now I will walk us through like step by step these uh, subqueries. That said, I can't say this enough. Don't let this intimidate you. And in fact, it kind of bothers me that in order to do this project, because Google doesn't have an example data set of Search Console data, and obviously I couldn't use client data. So it bothered me that I had to use such a complex SQL project, but I am going to take you by the hand and walk you through it. But most of the time when you're writing SQL queries, they're much more straightforward. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump into the query that returns landing pages and sessions for the Google Merchant Store for 2021, which I think was its most recent data. I just wanted to pull in a full year. I also wanted to include revenue, but there's no revenue data in this GA account, which is a bummer as it's an e-commerce store. But here we go. I'm not going to go into all the grisly details, at least not yet. Like I said, I used ChatGPT over many iterations to build this out. I also have a massive Google Doc with every query I think I've ever written, so I don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. It's like, let me, let me pull it up here. It's like, Oh man, it's 299 pages. <laughs> That's gonna bug me the rest of the day. But it's pretty extensive. But before generative AI, I relied almost exclusively on my Google Doc. Now you can do so much of this using generative AI. But the main point of the events CTE up here is to create a table in memory, that's what you're doing with the CTE. You're creating a table in memory that will query in the main query below, so down here. Maybe think of it like doing any prep work before the real job. So for example, I've been on a compote kick lately, not compost, <laughs> compote. It's a much bigger deal in Europe than it is here in the US, but as much as I'd love to be able to just come home and throw my peaches or my berries into a pot and get things going, I first need to clean them, remove the pits, stems, and any bad spots. Then I need to chop them up. And I like using glass containers like the chef. So when I'm finished my prep work, I'm no longer pulling ingredients from the bags I brought home from the grocery store and the containers of like salt and things like that. I'm not putting salt in compote, but I'm not pulling from these, like the raw ingredients. I've already measured things out. I've cleaned them, I've, I've prepped them. And that's kind of what we're doing with CTE. So we're getting our data ready, getting it all prepped so that we can do the main query. In this particular case, we need to identify landing pages. So we're going to use the extracted event date page URLs, which is called page location, a column of ones and nulls for entrances. I'll talk more about that in a minute and session IDs, which is basically like a social security number for your sessions. Uh, it, just like any other ID, it's a unique identifier and it tethers a session to a particular user. If there's anything that you see that's off or could be better optimized, I did throw this out to like my tribe and asked for input, but there isn't any guidance that I could find on how to pull this data. So open to any input. 
But one thing we can do when you're building out a CTE like this is to just copy it and run it as its own query. So if I just copy the part of the CTE that starts with your select statement, then I could just drop this in to another window and run it to see if it returns what I think it should return. In this case, it returns the date, the page location, entrances, as well as the GA session. But if someone at Google could please add a landing page analysis to your recipes, that would be fantastic. There are a few recipes on the site, I think 12. So if your data needs align with those 12 recipes, you're in luck. But if not, best of luck. You really, for a lot of this stuff, you should really probably have a data engineer doing these queries. So once our data is prepped, we can query it, which is what we do here. The part of the query here selects the landing page URLs, again, page location, and counts the number of unique sessions using this GA session ID that started on each landing page. It filters the data to include only sessions that marked an entrance, so entrances equals one or true, groups the results by landing page and orders them by the total number of sessions in descending order. So I, again, we'll, we'll circle back on this and kind of lean in a little bit more, but first we need to talk about this very complex event params field. The thing that makes these queries much more complicated than any queries I've had to write to date is Google has shoehorned a lot of data into its event params field. You can see that right here. So this is a record and that just means that it's nested. So there are other fields nested under this event params field. And you can see you have the key and then you have a value. And then under values, you have string value, integer value, float value, and double value. This gets ridiculously complicated in GA4. So again, don't let this scare you off. Even when I was dealing with much simpler data sets, this was a tough concept for me to wrap my mind around. So I'm determined in this video to try to explain it in a way that demystifies it a bit. To do that, let me switch to an image I prepared. So in this image, you see the events params field here, and then I've highlighted some other fields, but you need to pay close attention to this column over here called mode, especially if the field is a record, meaning again, it has other fields tucked away in its purse. If the mode is set to nullable, you can reference these nested fields using a dot notation. So for example, if I wanted to extract device category, which again tells you if the visitor came from desktop, mobile, or tablet, I can reference it by simply dropping device.category into my select statement. That's because device is set to nullable. And so I just put in device.category. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna type in here, select device.category. And then this from is just what table I'm pulling from. Now, because each table is an individual day, so the date it pulled up by default was January 31st, 2021. But one cool option you have is if you want, let's say all of 2021, which is what I wanted because I wanna make sure I'm pulling as many landing pages as I can for when I go and pull the status codes. What you can do is use an asterisk as a wild card. So I just put in 2021, this asterisk, you have to have these back ticks here, at least on a Mac, that key is just above the tab key. It shares a room with the tilde key. So that's how you're pulling that. And this is just the project. And then this here is the data set. And finally, this is the table. So here we're just saying pull 
all tables that contain events underscore 2021. So we're going to have a table for every day in the year 2021. And then we're going to group by one. I could type out device.category. I could also create an alias here, which I would strongly encourage you to do. And then you can even set the order again, just like the group by. I could spell this out, but I really like just referencing the index in the select statement. So anytime you reference a dimension, which is also known as a categorical variable, you need to group it in a group by clause. That's if you're rolling up by that dimension. So basically, if you are not returning every row of the table and instead you're rolling up by one or more dimensions, they have to be grouped. It's very similar to a pivot table. And if you don't have a metric included, which is also known as a measure or a continuous variable, doing this will just give you a deduplicated list. If I remove it, so if I remove this group by clause, it will return the value for every row in my data. So it's not deduplicated at all. And in most cases, it's pretty useless. One little tip I'll throw out here, this took me a little while to learn. Select is referred to as a statement. All the rest of them are referred to as clauses or all of the, the ones we'll be dealing with. So from group by having, we're not gonna deal with having today, but order by, those are all the clauses. So select is the only statement, unless you're doing like database management or something like that. There are some other statements, but in terms of querying data, then you have the select statement and then everything else is a clause. Okay, so a mode of nullable is easy peasy to handle, even if it's a record. Like I said, you just separate them with a period and then you can assign an alias. But if the mode is set to repeated, now you have some drama. So as you see in the fields highlighted in orange, this means that you can have lists of values in a single cell. At least it's easiest to picture in a cell. Like if you're used to Excel or Google Sheets, just think of like having a list of values in a cell. That is fine when it comes to storing data in a database. So you can store lists in a single cell, but you can't query them. So let's explain this with a very basic example just to help simplify the concept. So I created this worksheet here and over here to the left, we see this nested data. So I just used user ID because that's very common in analytics data. And then I assigned a categorical variable of fave color. So user one, their favorite color is not just one, it's orange and green. So obviously I'm user one. <laughs> These are my favorite colors. Analytics is branded with orange and green. User two, their favorite colors are red and blue. And user three, their favorite color, they only have one, it's magenta. So in this table, we have three users and their respective favorite color. In Python, lists are indicated with square brackets like we see here. You get very comfortable cherry picking individual values from both dictionaries and lists when you're working with APIs like OpenAI's API. But in a database, like I said, although you can store lists, you can't return them in a query. And so because of this limitation, you have to unnest or flatten these fields. So how can I explain this in very simple terms? If you're older than a millennial, you can think of this as like driving with kids before seatbelts became mainstream. Parents or your friends with cars would just smash as many kids as they could shoehorn onto a bench seat when they exceeded the number of intended seats. It was pandemonium. Think of a nesting like putting each kid in their own seat. To that end, let's look at that table after flattening it. Much better. Here we have user one, their favorite color is orange. 
User one, again, their favorite color is green. User two, red. User two, blue. User three, magenta. This a database can handle. So in BigQuery and PostgreSQL, that's done with an unnest function. Other database systems have similar functions. MySQL has JSON functions like JSON table. Oracle has a table function and it goes on and on. Personally, I like Oracle's table function. I think it's the most intuitively named function, but nobody checked with me first, but they all do the same thing. They just give you a mechanism for flattening these tables. So going back to Google Analytics 3 or Universal Analytics, this was Easy Street. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that now. So to pull up the GA3 analytics, I can just type in analytics here. Like I said, the search function works for GA3 and I'm even able to favorite it, but it doesn't work for GA4, at least not for me. So the project here is BigQuery public data. This is the data set and this is the table GA underscore session. So the first thing I like to do is to click on it and pull up the schema. And this is what we'll be working from here. The visits were nested under totals and because its mode was nullable, we could just use the dot notation. I'll demo that in a minute. But to query landing page, it was nested under hits, which had a mode of repeated. So you had to flatten that array but it was easy. I didn't realize how good I had it. The most complicated part was grabbing the URL, which was called page path. It was nested like you see here under page, which was nested under hits. So we had to flatten the array, but because it's considerably easier than GA4, I'll go ahead and demo that. If you click on these, three dots here, you can click query and that will open up a query. And just to get it off my back, I put in the asterisk and that just means select everything, which we're not going to do here. I'll just type page dot page path as landing page. So this as landing page is just an alias. So again, if you think of Excel or Google Sheets, what do you want that column name to be called? And it's really not a good practice to have spaces. You technically can, but you have to like surround them with back ticks, but the other analysts will judge you. Next up, we'll grab sessions. To do this, I'll just type sum totals. Again, this, because it's nullable, I can just type in totals dot visits and assign that an alias. I just used sessions. This is my table. Now let's go ahead and unnest that hits field. The first thing we need to do is add a comma after the table name here. And that comma is important. I personally like to put the unnest function on its own line, but I've seen people combine them. But even if you combine them, you have to have that comma. So you just do that with this function unnest and then in parentheses hits as H. So here's another little tip. I included an alias here because that's pretty standard practice. And then what you can do is go back to page dot page path and prepend it with that H. So I could type H dot page dot page path and it will run. But in reality, neither the alias nor the prepended H are necessary or required. In fact, if I remove the H and remove the alias and I run this query, it works fine. The reason for that is once you unnest your array, BigQuery knows explicitly which column you want to reference. So there's no ambiguity here. 
where these aliases become more important is more when you're dealing with joins. So I just had to do that earlier this week. I had to join two tables and they shared a column name. And so I just assigned aliases to them. And just to be explicitly clear, I included the alias before the column name. And so then that removed that ambiguity. I'm just going to delete it here. I just included it initially just to make this point. So one thing I did early on when I was unnesting is I would do a cross join here. And this was something I learned from a friend, John Marr, absolutely brilliant data engineer. And the person who primarily kind of mentored me in SQL is that I didn't need to have that cross join. In lieu of the cross join, I could just put a comma after the table name that I was referencing. So you may see it either way. You might see it with the cross join or without it, but if you don't see the cross join, there will absolutely be that comma after the table name. So whichever you feel most comfortable, just go with that. Okay, onward and upward. Because I've included a categorical variable or dimension in my query, I'm going to need a group by clause. So I'll just group by one and I'll order by two and I want these in descending order. One other note I'll make here for the neophytes is I like to put my functions and all of my keywords in all caps. It just bothers me when it's inconsistent, which is the norm. Like most analysts and data scientists I see just go with whatever the autocomplete gives them. I just like things to be very uniform. Now, the one thing with GA3 is the landing page just returns the URI. So what I would typically do is come in here and also add the host name. And there are different ways that you can pull up these different variables. You could just take your chance at typing if you know how the variable name starts. But I typically just leave the schema open in a tab. So I can go in here and either search or browse. Browsing can be good for kind of learning the data set better, but I'll just start to type in host name here and I see, oh, okay, it's under hits, which we've already flattened. So I can just reference page dot host name as host name. And now I need to group by one and two because these are both categorical variables. And if we had more time, I would actually recreate the URL, like just add in the, the protocol and then concatenate the host name with the landing page. Another thing I'll do is remove the query parameters, but I'll cover that in another video. Okay, so back to GA4. Before I dive into this horrendous query, I pulled together another table to kind of give you a hundred foot view on these key value pairs. So in column B, I have the keys listed alphabetically. In column C, I have a brief description of what that key is used for. And in D, I have what I believe to be the data type. Those I've italicized because they're not part of the actual export. Those are just kind of helper columns. Um, hopefully they'll help you as much as they help me. And if you hover over the column names, you'll see more tips. Then in columns E through H, we have the value categories. I just returned one row per key using the max function. That was just because when I first was playing around with a query, it had thousands of rows. So I was like, okay, I want to get an idea of the types of values that I could see, especially with Boolean values. I was curious since they don't have a Boolean data type, how they handled that. 
So I just pulled in the max. And again, it's just to kind of give me and to give hopefully you an idea of the types of values that you can see. This account doesn't use all of the keys, most don't. However, you can see if the key is Boolean, and remember that means true, false, it will return a one for true. So if it is a Boolean value, it just returns a one for true and a null if it's false. We use that to return landing pages by filtering entrances equals one. And we'll take another look at that. But it looks like they're not very consistent in their formatting because the outbound key over here came through as true, a string instead of one. So maybe they have more potential values than just true or false. I don't know. I didn't uh, dive into that. I already was spending too much time on this tutorial. I will also share a Dropbox folder with everything, including like the images that I used. Last thing I'll note is they also set some values to obfuscated, uh, like search term and term. Search term, by the way, refers to a site search and term refers to paid search. So I guess redacted was too intuitive. The last thing I'll say about this query is that each of these select statements within the main select statement is a subquery. That's why they're wrapped in parentheses like this. The first one is saying, unless the event params field, because its mode is set to repeated, then for each date, return the value.string value column where the key is set to page location and name it page location. So in this table here, you'll see page location, that's the key, and it returns the string value. And it returns a string value because this is a string data type. And this was something that I found confusing when I was first trying to wrap my mind around it at least until I created this table, because I just couldn't tell, well, how do I know whether to ask for the string value or the int value or the float value? Because you can see here, none of these keys use the float value. When they use anything that's not an integer, they use the double value. So I'm not exactly sure why it seems a little overkill, but you just find the key here, then you can read this description, see the data type, and then this data type will inform where you will find the value because it's going to be in one of these columns. It's not going to be in multiple columns. So you see here, this percent scrolled, this is an integer, and this value was 90. So they're using an integer for percent scrolled, not my favorite, but that's okay. For the next column, it's just saying for each date and URL, return the integer value where key equals entrances. So let's look for entrances. That's over here. And that is going to return this integer value. And this integer value is either going to be one or null and you can see an example of one here. So if it was a landing page, there will be a one, like there is here. And if it wasn't, if that URL wasn't a landing page, it was just another page that was hit at some point during that session, it will return a null. And finally, for this last select statement, we're saying for each date URL that was a landing page, return the GA session ID. So then to take us home, we'll rename the page location landing page because page location is weird. And we'll count the unique session IDs where it was an entrance, i.e. a landing page. We only needed those other dimension columns that were in the CTE for filtering purposes. So they won't be in our final output.
I've seen instances where someone will print it in the final output. I'll only do that when I'm testing it. Like let's say I'm filtering by a particular medium. I might go ahead and set up the filter and still have medium in its own column. But then once I see that the filter is working properly, I remove it from the select statement because we don't need it. It's just repetitive and not informative. Then we'll group by landing page and sort by sessions in descending order. And now let's let it fly. Here we go. Landing pages, sessions, sorted in descending order by sessions. So that concludes this part of the project. Next, we'll tackle some Python to record our status codes and bolster our code with a generous amount of error handling. So if there's a glitch in our file, it doesn't fail. It'll be fun. I've tested this pretty extensively. I'll see you then. It's good to be back.